Well met everyone. This is the Tal'Dorei campaign setting, a 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons world. This is a world created, written by Matthew Mercer. He is the dungeon master for a juggernaut of gameplay and D&D &D adventure known as Critical Role. Many, many years ago, Matthew Mercer and his friends put their adventures and their table out there for the rest of us to see via a Twitch stream. That thing has turned into, as I said, a juggernaut. They have reached a sort of celebrity status at this point. To give you an indication as to how big they are and have become, recently Critical Role put out a Kickstarter to try and obtain some funds to help them create some animated cartoons based upon the exploits and adventures of their gaming group. They asked for $750,000, and last I checked, towards the end of the Kickstarter, they were somewhere in the neighborhood of $8 million. Why do I tell you this? First and foremost, this is a campaign setting that was released somewhere, I believe, around late 2017. You may already have looked into this book, as I'm a dollar short, and obviously, a year or more late to the table. Why do the review now? Perhaps you're new to this entire DM thing and you're out there looking for a world. In that you are a new dungeon master, you are just venturing forth, seeking out a world to use at your table. Perhaps you're entirely new to the hobby. Maybe you don't even know what critical role is. And in that regard, I think you are a prime candidate to purchase a world such as this. I will reveal my hand to you and tell you quite simply the world is outstanding if you took it and isolated it stand alone for what it is and what you get the content between cover to cover but if there was any i'm not sure what the word is perhaps anti-selling point anything that i would mention in this entire video that might stray you away from purchasing this book it would be for those DMs that know what Critical Role is, perhaps you're one of the ones that supported them. Clearly, with $8 million in funding on their Kickstarter, there is a massive group, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of supporters of everything that Matt Mercer is doing at the table. For that group, you're invested. You watch the streams. You watch their gameplay sessions. You know their characters. You're a fan of it. And most importantly, why you're perhaps searching out this world is you're a fan of the world of Tal'Dorei. Be careful in comparison. If you know how Matt Mercer has run, understand this is his baby. It's his creation. He is going to know it better than any other dungeon master out there, myself included. And we've watched, we've been witness to his excellence. He's a voice actor. Before he ever put, and he and his group were ever on screen in front of the audience, in front of all of us, the tens of thousands out there to see, he's put in his time. He's been, this is not his first rodeo. He's a dungeon master. He has the skill set. He is also probably most recognizable as McCree, the voice in Overwatch. He's a voice actor. So his NPCs have a level of immersion and just straight epicness to it that we could only strive to reach half of. His players at the table, they're disciplined, they're veterans of role-playing, they're understanding, they're voice actors as well, so they bring a whole new definition to the term staying in character. The production quality, based on the fact that his game has to be presented to a large audience, the audio quality, the camera angles, the camera work, he's got Dwarven Forge and he has all of the bits. He has something like a twenty, thirty thousand dollars gaming table that they play on. It's all larger than life, over the top, and epic. And what we have pales in comparison. If there were going to be comparisons, it's never going to live up to that. So if we try and take more than just inspiration, it's okay to run this world and then watch a video and see how Matt Mercer ran his group through the same region that you're intending to use, but use that for inspiration. Use it as a catalyst to help you improve your game as a dungeon master. But if you're trying to emulate, copy, and recreate the experience that we thoroughly enjoy watching at your table, I think you're setting yourself up for failure and this world may not be a fit for, for you because it's going to be too closely attached to what we already perceive 
is excellence in the D&D gaming space. This world might not even be a fit for your group. There may be some nuances and details that don't work well for you. The style of game that Matt runs, though it's immensely entertaining to watch, his game is not necessarily going to be your game. It doesn't have to always be some comparison thing. So if you can separate, look into the world. If you can't, perhaps look elsewhere. So let's jump over to the PDF. That is another kind of quick moment, a caveat, if you will. I don't have the actual book, but I've been to my local gaming store. It's pretty hefty. It's about the size of, I think it's even larger than a DMG and a PHB. It's about the size of my creature codex on the shelf. Quality control is excellent. So though I don't have the book, I can still confidently comment on its build quality and makeup. It's well built, cover to cover. The insert, the pages, everything feels good. Nothing feels like the binding is going to rip and break on you. I believe it does come with a map, you know, kind of a fold out that's either inserted in or it's cellophaned separately on top of the book. You know, I'll show you the map when we get to PDF. I bought it in PDF form. So content is content page for page. The information's identical. It's just obviously presented in digital format. I'll start with showing you the map first, which was a separate PDF, and then we'll take it from there and we'll navigate our way through it. So I appreciate you all for watching. Let's jump into the book. And here we're looking at the realm of Tal'Dorei. This is the map. As an artist and designer, I make a lot of my own maps. I'm pretty good. I'm not quite to this level, but I'm getting close. This is phenomenal. Just really well made. Things stand out. Sort of an indicator of the quality that you're going to get within the book is how good the map is. As I said, this is a PDF. So I was when I purchased it in PDF format, I got a separate PDF which has the map. Getting into the meat and potatoes, the book itself. First thing you'll notice is the artwork. I've been following concept art since early 80s. Brian Froud and Dark Crystal and Sid Mead and Tron. So when I see some good art, I know that's a subjective thing. I know what I'm looking at. I've, I've seen a lot of stuff. And this concept art, the art in this book, is on par with some of the best art I've ever seen. This front cover here has the characters from the Critical Role. I believe that's Percy and Keyleth and Pike and Grog and whatnot. The layout is excellent. I like that it has this sort of bloodstained sort of motif and direction to it. It has that sort of transparent overlay. Just a good way to display information. It's well written in just font style and usage. Too often you'll see world building and design books and gameplay books that want to stay and stick so closely to the theme and the aesthetic of a thing that they choose the wrong fonts. If it's very sci-fi, the, the font looks too sci-fi. I like that the font here is very familiar to what we might see within a novel. So it's easily readable and things are laid out in columns so your eyes aren't darting around the page. And as I said, with the red blood stains, which kind of create that vintage coffee stain look, it is able to convey and give you information so you know where you are, which is really important as a graphic designer for about 25 years Again, you want good aesthetics and you want a good vibe and feel to a written piece, but most importantly, it needs to be legible and you need to be able to navigate through a piece efficiently. If we start with chapter one, you're looking at campaigns in Tal'Dorei is what it's called. And here you're dealing with the history and the legend of things, the background. You know, this happened 800 years ago, this happened 1,000 years ago, and so on. There aren't any tables or definitive things that you take with you from here to your table, but... There's enough here that you can kind of start to spark and fuel the imagination as a dungeon master and then run with it from there. This section is outstanding. So you have these story hooks here, and I'll just read this to you. This book is peppered with story hooks. Some are simple, just enough to inspire your next game session. Some are more complex, and the hook can cascade into an entire campaign's worth of gaming. And then the way the hooks pre are presented are in four levels. You have hooks that are offered for low-level characters, one through four, mid-level, high-level, and epic-level characters. And it says here that these level recommendations can be fudged, but have generally been chosen either because of the monsters involved, the lore relevance of the location, or to determine how epic the adventure should be. The beauty of something like this in this book is it is a way to bridge the gap between awesome story detail and background and something that might happen at the gaming table. Too often I'll read wonderful books and stories that are intended to be a campaign guide, something that the DM can bring with him to the table to run their PCs through sessions and it stays in this realm of this happened 10,000 years ago and here's and it's it could be a wonderful story that reads like a novel like Tolkien or something. The problem is what the hell does that have to do with my character today? During a six-hour session, 
what does my character get to do? What do my PCs get to take with them? What do they get to put on their character sheet that makes them feel like they're a part of this big, grand, epic story? And with these story hooks, it does an excellent job of, cool, you read some neat stuff. Now here's what you can bring with you in prep time, or here's what you can bring to the table to get them moving through hours of gameplay. And I think bridging that gap is a very good thing. It's something that all books should do, and this book does that very well. So there it kind of introduces it to you, and it does mention that the story hooks are sort of introductions. They're fuel for the Dungeon Master's imagination, something that he can use and manifest into an actual gameplay session, but they don't have any definitive end. You run with it where you need to go with it. As we continue scrolling through chapter one, you get into the Pantheon of Exandria. It lists the gods. It gives you an alignment. What are their domains? If we were to equate this to Forgotten Realms, it kind of shows you between those statements there or what's listed and the commandments, which are sort of the principles of that god, it lets you know, are we talking about Tyr or Mistra, or are we talking more about Siric or Bane? You get a real quick indication of what sort of god this is and what that religion might be like. Awesome aesthetic. Artwork, again, is top-notch. These are basically the medieval logos, right? We know when we see the golden arches what sort of food we can expect from that. We know when we see the Apple symbol or a Google symbol or Coca-Cola. We understand that product visually. So by having good accompanying motifs and coat of arms and heraldry, you know when you see the all hammer symbol on a banner or on the side of a castle or a patrol of priests with vestments wearing the all hammer, you know that there's accompanying visuals that represent an entity and an idea. So really good in that regard. There's a bunch of gods. They all get the same treatment. As you scroll down further, you'll get into the betrayer gods, which are basically the evil ones and with the accompanying artwork that shows your typical evil motifs of chains and spikes and horns and so on. Continuing on further, we get into the races of Tal'Dorei. It mentions that all of these races are basically as they are in the player's handbook. So you're going to get some sentences and paragraphs that give some descriptions of the role that these races play in the world and how they're perceived. But otherwise, for the traits, the things of what kind of stat modifiers do they have and what are their abilities, you want to defer to the player's handbook for that. So here you have Mountain Dwarves, Hill Dwarves, and Duragar do exist. You've got Wood Elves, High Elves, and Drow. You have the both Lightfoot and Stout Halflings. You have humans, you have dragonborn. Now it does mention there is a group known as the Ravenites. And should your character, as it says here, be born from the toil and history of the Ravenite clans, you would make some adjustments to the base dragonborn that's inside the player's handbook. Meaning that you're going to have some different ability score increases, damage resistance, and base walking speed than what might otherwise be presented in the player's handbook. So where it defers or gives you additional information, it indicates that as such. You've got rock and forest gnomes, Goliaths, which I believe are from Volo's Guide, half forks, half elves, Ganassi tiefling. So it has all of the detail on what can you play and what is their perception in the world and how they fit into the lore and story. But of course, refer to those appropriate books for the details of the things you write on your character sheet. Then we get into the factions and societies, the groups, the organizations. Has a wonderful heading, so you know exactly who you're reading. Once again, beautiful imagery to depict, you know, here you have the eye with the sort of purple purple surfboard. It gives you a rough description on this is what this organization is and represents. This is these are their goals. Those are the the goals and relationships where relationships talk about who their allies might be, what other organizations are they at war or battling with. That and goals are the two things that a DM can use to help him start to formulate some interesting gameplay, how your characters might be involved with such organizations. It gives you figures of interest. So now we're getting into really good stuff as far as NPCs go and who are the various individuals and entities that your PCs might meet to sort of be the middleman between the overview of the organization and on the character street level. So it does that for all of the varying organizations. There's a bunch here. Really good, really well done. Beautiful artwork, again, showing what they look like and represent aesthetically and visually. You've got little tidbits like this in the corner here in this blood splat. It doesn't interfere with the overall aesthetic and layout and flow of the book, but it's little bits of lore and extra added depths and layers of detail that the DM or the writer, or perhaps it's like first person point of view from someone that exists within this world is trying to give you just some extra bits of information. Again, more fuel for the imagination and for the DM. As we continue on through, 
you then get through the organizations into the best part of it all, which is the Gazetteer of Tal'Dorei. Here we're looking at the regions and the places. It starts with the calendar and how the time and the months work and what the holidays are and what they're named. And then you get into regions such as the Lucidian Coast. And when you look at the region, it shows you a little region map and it gives you really brilliantly what are the major religions within that region? What are the imports? What are the exports? These type of things inform the dungeon master and the players of when you're in that region, this sort of explains why the roads are well patrolled and why they're well guarded. What are they protecting? What, are, what is the overall region about? What's important to them? And as you get into the regions, you get into the individual important areas, such as Drina, which is a town. Whenever you have a town or a livable place, it gives you a population and a breakdown percentage-wise of what races might be there. And now you get into the good parts, the best parts of the entire book. Within each of these areas of interest, you have these possible quests. So it has awesome story and lore as to what this region and area is about. And now here's an adventure that you can actually start to plan during a session and take with you to the table so that your PCs have something to do when they're there. You're not just telling them how cool and the legend of this place. There's now actual, you know, in video game parlance, there's an actual quest that now just popped up. And it does that for every single area in the book. So there's tons and tons of quests here, which is just outstanding. So as we scroll through, you'll see that you have awesome region stuff. And when a region has something that talks about, you know, this region of Zephra talks about how the Arashari are using sky sails. There's a little pop-up box of a newly created magic item of sky sails, and there's some accompanying artwork. When you get into a region that has a city such as Whitestone, you will inevitably get the city breakdown of population and races, and you'll often get a map of that city. So there's just a lot of good bits. As I said, most importantly, you get quests. Here's the interesting things my characters can do when they're in this area. And as we continue on through, it just there's just more and more of this goodness. Here's some, you're dealing with a, a dark sort of criminal region called Kaimal, Kaimal. And within that, here's some drugs that have been made and, and just sort of extra little bits of detail, things that can go onto a character sheet, really good bits of detail. As we continue to scroll down and get through the Gazetteer, you'll eventually wait, make your way into the character options. For this, you've got a new, divine, a new divine domain known as the Blood Domain. You have a new primal path for barbarians called Path of the Juggernaut. There is a sorcerer origin known as the Rune Child. And you've got a new monastic tradition for Monk's Way of the Cobalt Soul. And it's given the full player's handbook treatment, you know, where it shows you here's the things you get at what level and whatnot. And these are things that have a background to them. So it explains that these are things that your character can become and things that are on your sheet that help you in gameplay. And they're based on the lore and they're steeped within the history of the place. So they make sense. And it tells you here in this box, if you want additional options, there is the Blood Hunter class. If you know Critic Role and you've watched any of the videos of their gameplay, you'll know that some of these things exist. You have a Blood Hunter class, you have the Gunslinger, which is what Percy plays, and then you have the College of Maestro. For that, you'll go to DM's Guild for sort of more detailed character options. But within this book, you have those four new options. You've got some new backgrounds, depending on what organization might be affiliated with. With all of the trimmings that you'd expect, it gives you your skill and tool proficiencies and what equipment and languages they start with. It even has variant background options. So you've got all that good, those good bits. You have the new feats, more character options, once again, that fit within the lore and theme of the world. For example, let's say we're talking Dark Sun. For those of you that know, it's a very Mad Maxian wastelandy dark harsh world for something like that it would make sense to allow your characters to have some sort of survival or endurance type of feats in this particular case because matt mercer has already run players through this world he has found some character options through new feats and backgrounds and new character things like the primal path barbarian that he believes are more fun they just create better more exciting characters that are a result of the way things are within the legend and lore of the world. So a bunch of new feats here, which is excellent. You have new magic items. These are called the vestiges, vestiges of divergence. I believe these are like artifact level items that sort of level up and can be unlocked for additional powers called awakened. 
So you've got a bunch of new magic items in this world as well. These are type of things, the feats, the magic items, things that you can, yes, they're steeped within the lore of Tal'Dorei and this world, but they're certainly things that you can sort of shopping list and take with you and throw into your own world should you just use this book for information and inspiration and you don't want to actually run your players through this world. You'll get into what is sort of Matt Mercer's house rules, optional campaign rules and guidelines. Take a look through that. You'll get that as well. And then finally, you're going to get into the allies and the adversaries, so monstrous races, the beast folk, so that it takes something like a centaur or a knoll, and it makes them more than just something that you get EXP from and you roll initiative against. It kind of gives that centaurs, driders, and knolls are people too. And because of the lore and story, they may be perceived differently, but it adds just a layer of depth and it turns these otherwise combat encounters into actual living, breathing NPCs that you might interact with on a different, deeper level. It does the same for the actual organization. So you have the Ashari, you have Cinder Elementals, and it comes with the full Monster Manual treatment where they're statted out should you use them as allies, as NPCs, or maybe you fight against them. Maybe you're dealing with the organization of the class and they're an enemy and you need to get some stats with some accompanying artwork on what are the members of the class like and what are their features and traits. It has that for you in all of that regard. So... Moving through it all, it ends with just some cool artwork, some cool things. You know, here's some goat knights. These are the type of things you'll see wandering the roads along the mountainside roads of Cliff Keep Mountains. So awesome things like that. And then it finishes off entirely with an index, which is entirely alphabetized to navigate your way efficiently through the book. I believe it's a good book. As I said in the very beginning, as long as you can make a separation between the game that you might run and the game that you might already know as witness to the wonder and excellence of Matt Mercer. Remember, it's his baby. He knows the world better. His group, his table is filled with veteran role players, voice actors. So everything is always outstanding. If you don't compare and you try and create your version of this world, and Matt even mentions that in the very very beginning, which permeates and is indicated, and you can pick up on that as you read through the book. Matt says that if you were to take this world, and even if he himself was sitting at your gaming table, he wouldn't say anything if you changed something or manipulated it or added or removed something. He's very open, and he always has been, in allowing others to just be inspired by him, but make it your world. He's very respectful of the opportunity that all Dungeon Masters have to take whatever they want, manipulate it and twist it, and make it their own. And as long as you can do that, I think it's a good fit, and this is a wonderful book with outstanding content. That's all I've got for you folks. I hope it helped you and informed you into making a good decision as to whether this is a fit for you and your gaming group. Thank you for watching, everyone. Take care.